as we all meet beneath this gray street in our cozy homes. We won't wait till the night before Christmas to have hope. Though we may hide from the spot side, drinking tea and wearing fleece, we won't wait till the night before Christmas to feel peace. We know Christ is coming soon. We've known it all along. In just a few short wintry nights, we'll give shouts of joy and of song. Now all look east in the night and sky, waiting for the star above. But we'd never wait till the night before Christmas to give love. Welcome to worship at Gray Street United Church. Let us begin with this statement of territorial acknowledgement. We gather for worship and work in Treaty 1 territory, which is also the homestead of the Métis Nation. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples walked this land and knew it to be the center of their lives and their spirituality. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Pollock, and I'm a mission and service representative at Gray Street United Church. On behalf of the Gray Street family, it is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to the St. Paul's Community of Faith in Bozizier, who join us this morning and through the Advent season. We welcome one and all who join us today in this time of worship. I'd like to take a few moments this morning to talk about something that's dear to my heart and to Gray Street United Church. 2020 has been a year that truly will go down in history and is still unfolding before our eyes. As part of the history of changes and new challenges, this is also true of how mission and service can raise funds in a virtual world. As of October 2020, the mission and service total giving for the month was $433, with a year-to-date contribution of $5,184.60. It leaves us a little wiggle room to move closer to our goal of 9,000, which brings me to why your participation is so important. Many years ago, the Lights of Hope tree was started here at Grace Street United Church, and we would like to continue what has become really a church family tradition. Every year, we have the opportunity to formally remember a loved one or honor someone special in our lives. You may also wish to honor a special celebration that has been part of your life this year, such as a birth of a child, a grandchild, or maybe a graduation, wedding, or a special anniversary. Truly, the list is endless. Now, the challenge. This year, the Lights of Hope tree will not be set up in the sanctuary, and neither will it be virtual. This year, we have a living Lights of Hope tree. It's located on Gray Street side of the building. And imagine the joy this tree wrapped in a blanket of warm seasonal lights with memories of our loved ones dancing in the breeze will bring not only to our community, but to our church families. Truly, a tree filled with love, hope, and peace, set in a peaceful surrounding. For those of you who receive printed copies of your weekly bulletins by Canada Post or by special delivery, you will receive a Lights of Hope Christmas tag, as well an envelope. Once completed, please call our spirited elf, Kathy Welby, at 204-668-8864 if you have any questions 
or to arrange pickup of your envelope. Your angel or star honoring your loved one will be laminated and hung from the Lights of Hope tree every Sunday after service. And many of us who have received our Lights of Hope Christmas tag through email with a reminder to join this service today. Thank you for coming and enjoying this service and to hear this message. Your Christmas tag and envelope can be dropped off in the church mailbox. Please note that this will be monitored. Your angel or star honoring your loved one will be laminated and hung from the Tree of Hope Sunday after church. Now I know a few of you who live out of town, the Lights of Hope Tree isn't as accessible. So through the comfort of your home, the tag can be emailed to grayunited at gmail.com and your donation to Mission and Services Lights of Hope can be done through the donation button at GSUC website at www.graystreetunitedchurch.com. Your angel or star honoring your loved one will be laminated and hung from that Lights of Hope tree Sunday after service. The Right Reverend Richard Bott, moderator of the United Church of Canada, wrote, Mission and service takes on new importance as the church responds to the worldwide COVID-19 crisis. Our ministries in Canada and across the world are acting quickly to help people whose lives have suddenly changed. In-person outreach programs closed by social distancing have now been replaced by food distribution and finding safe homes for peoples. Who are homeless. Hospital chaplains are caring for COVID-19 victims and their families. People are being helped to adapt to the pandemic conditions and taught how the virus to keep, sorry, to keep the virus from spreading. Virtual camps and education programs are being offered to support families in isolation at home. Your gifts to mission and services makes this all possible. You are truly an example of what it means to love one another. Thank you for your participation in the Lights of Hope campaign and for being part of our amazing ministry. Lighting the way for a brighter future and thanking you in advance. Your mission and services enthusiasts, Cheryl. Polilic and Deborah Haloka. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. Um, Cheryl may have mentioned and may not have mentioned that today is the first Sunday of Advent and it is also Communion Sunday. So I invite you to prepare yourselves for communion, get your tea and toast, or uh, maybe it's bread and, and juice, we don't know. But remember, just grab something so that you can lift with us and celebrate with us. We're going to begin with our call to worship. Good morning, Darcia. Good morning. What is this Advent all about? It's about waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for the Christ child. Well, wasn't he born like way long, long ago? Yes, but we wait for him to be born again in our hearts, in our minds, and in our actions. But how? When we speak words of peace, when we live lives of justice, when we work for hope and peace, when we worship God, then the Christ child lives in us. In all of us? In all of us. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen. Amen. Join us in the water. 
Today, we light the first Advent candle, and we begin to wait. We are looking forward to something special. What can it be? When is it going to happen? When we light this candle, we watch, wait, and hope we prepare. This candle is a symbol for our own longing for God to be with us. We wait in hope for God to surprise us and break into our lives. Hope burns brightly in November darkness. Hope will be our guide as we journey to Bethlehem this season of Advent. Let us pray. You are the hope of the world, God. You are the guiding light of our lives. Open our eyes to your hope that we might be eyes, hearts, hands of hope, everywhere we go. We ask this in Christ's name. May it be so. Amen.
Hi, kids. It's great to see you. Little kids, big kids, we're all kids, aren't we? Well, this Advent season, we're going to be doing something that we have done before, but not everybody has. So it's something that we do every year or start or, you know, start to start to do this time of the year. We're going to be unwrapping the Christmas crush. Here's the book. And that's what it looks like. Some of you have read it, some maybe not. But that's what we're going to do. Now, crush. What's a crush? Hmm. Well, it's a nativity scene. It's the whole scene of the stable and Mary and Joseph and all of the animals. But we're going to build out one by one. Can you tell me what you think might be the very first thing that we add to that stable as it sits there? I've got an idea. Look what I've got. It's the angel. The angel was the first one there, I'm sure. And so let's put the angel in her place this very first Sunday of Advent. Now that's looking not too bad. We've got a lot more to add. How about we get ready for that baby Jesus to come? And what do we need for a baby? The very first thing you need. The baby's uh, cradle or the manger, the place where the baby sleeps. Let's put that right down here. And you know what? The angel can watch over and make sure that that baby is safe and everything is going to be prepared. Now weeks two, three, and four, we're gonna be keeping, to, keeping on building that and getting things ready for Christmas Eve when the baby is going to come. Now, let's have a word of prayer. And I'm going to invite Darcia to come up and pray with me. You guys know this prayer too, so I'd like you to pray along as well. Let's go. Our mother, mother and, and father, father who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sherry Swain. I'm from St. Paul's United Church, and I'm very excited to be with you today. First reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. 
May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always give thanks to my God for you because of the grace he has given you through Christ Jesus. For in union with Christ, we have become rich in all things, including all speech and all knowledge. The message about Christ has become so firmly established in you that you have not failed to receive a single blessing as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be faultless on the day our Lord Jesus Christ comes. God is to be trusted, the God who called you to have fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our second reading is Mark 13, verse, uh, verse 13, uh, chap no, sorry. Chapter 13, verse 24 to 37. In the days after that time of trouble, the sun will grow dark. The moon will no longer shine. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers in space will be driven from their course. Then the son of man will appear, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send the angels out to the four corners of the earth to gather God's chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Let the fig tree teach you a lesson. When its branches become green and tender and it starts putting out leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you will know that the time is near, ready to begin. Remember that all these things will happen before the people now living have all died. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows, however, when that day or hour will come. Neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father knows. Be on watch, be alert. For you do not know when the time will come. It will be like a man who goes away from his home on a trip and leaves his servants in charge after giving to each one his own work to do, and after telling the doorkeeper to keep watch. Watch then, because you do not know when the master of the house is coming. It might be in the evening, or at midnight, or before dawn, or at sunrise. If he comes suddenly, he must not find you asleep. What I say to you then, I say to all, watch. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's begin our message with a prayer. God of hope, joy, peace, and love, this Advent Sunday we hear you calling us as we stand in our own wilderness, urging us to move out of the darkness and into a place where we can not only hear you, but also see you and live in your light of love. We ask this morning that you bless and increase our understanding of your ways for us within this confusing world that we live in. Amen. I'll tell you what keeps me coming to this church. The man who spoke was punching the air with his finger, pronouncing every word. I'll tell you, he said, what keeps me coming to this church. And every head turned his direction. Then sudden rush of interest made him hesitate, uncertain of his own thought, but he pushed on. It's strange, I know, but I get the feeling here like nowhere else that something is about to happen. Wow, the feeling that something is about to happen. It's a strange notion. And yet the earliest Christians would have recognized it instantly as one of the truest marks of the church. They were convinced they stood on the cusp of history, and that something indeed was about to happen. For the world, 
time lumbered on, day after winsium day, moving toward who knows what, but for the early Christian community, something was about to happen. As time crept forward, a great, though yet unseen, future had stirred and gathered itself and now was sweeping towards time itself on a curse, course of in in inevitable collision. Something was about to happen. But what? What was about to happen? Their attempts to describe it strained the boundaries of their language as surely as they strained our contemporary imaginations. The kingdom of God is at hand. The stars fall from heaven. The night is far gone. We will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This age is passing away. Come, Lord Jesus. The church lived on tippy-toe, straining their eyes towards the horizon. Something was about to happen. They lived in hope. Because something was about to happen, every word they uttered, every deed they did, every prayer they prayed was shaped by this coming event. Like an actor in a play whose role seems insignificant until the disclosure that his lines held the key to the truth all along. The early Christians risked that shame of the world confidently awaiting that final act. We have all known, in some ways, the energy an eagerly anticipated future can give to our actions in the present. The expectant parents who find joy in what would otherwise be toil, things like assembling a crib, painting the nursery, practicing the pushing and the breathing. The residents of a town who mow their lawns and sweep the sidewalks or repair the cracked windows in the city hall and stretched out colorful banners across the storefronts as they ready themselves for the visit of a dignitary. Christmas itself has this kind of a power. People brave crowds at the mall and the edgy clerks. Gifts are carefully chosen, packages wrapped, and ceramic nativity scenes are dusted off and set piece by piece on the mantel. Every action has meaning because something is about to happen. But we have also known the sense of loss and disappointment over a hoped for future, which does not come when nothing, nothing really happens. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent, a time of anticipation and waiting and preparing for the arrival of that Christ child. The Christ child being the hope of the world, the hope that we anticipate in our lives as well. Well, I feel this anticipation this year, maybe in a different way, don't you? This past week, I left the house only to walk the dogs, get the mail, and I did pick up a few groceries a couple of times. And I watched out the window while our soon-to-be new neighbors hauled in truckload after truckload of soil around the foundation of their newly built basement in preparation for their home to be moved on the spot. I paced the dining room to the living room around the kitchen 
I listened to the news, asking myself the question before the reporter could even say it, how many new cases? How many in hospital? How many deaths? And then I was once again reminded, stay at home, go out for essentials only. <sighs> Talk about a sense of loss and the feeling of disappointment. It's Advent. We are supposed to be getting ready. We're supposed to be shopping for the people that we love, writing Christmas cards, decking the halls, baking. We are supposed to be living in anticipation and hope. And many of us are feeling quite depressed, sad, and oppressed. We are anticipating a very different Christmas from any other we have ever seen before. Self-isolation and being locked down puts new meaning into the words, I'll be home for Christmas. Will we see our families and share time and food and beverage? We already know that we will worship together virtually through recorded services. This year, we know the sense of loss and we know the sense of disappointment. Even if things do lift at the last moment, we are still feeling disappointed and we are feeling loss. And even if restrictions do lift, will it be safe? Do we take the chance? My friends, it's easy to get stuck in the mud of loss and disappointment. You know, even on regular non-COVID Christmases, the packages are open and the gifts are admired and then simply put away. The tree comes down, the shepherds and the angels are stored for another year, and the long-awaited day passes with a sense that nothing, nothing really has happened. In a far more profound way, the church has always struggled with its pain over a future which fails to come or happen. Come, Lord Jesus, they prayed, but it was Roman soldiers who came instead. This world is passing away, they sang, but the world remained. One can live on tippy-toe only so long before the muscles grow tired and the eyes grow weary of looking for the light of a day which never draw dawns. If the church is standing at the threshold of God's future kingdom of justice, then the church can dare to touch the wounds of lepers and freely pour out its resources for the poor. If this world is... Surely in the thrones of death and the new age of healing and mercy is close at hand, then the church can cheerfully bear some rejection, endure some suffering, and faithfully sing its hallelujahs. But, but if there is no God-shaped future at hand, then nothing, nothing really is about to happen. Of that day or of that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And that's written in Mark 13, verse 32. What this means, starkly put, is that God's future will not arrive when we want it, or plan it, or even think we need it. It will come not according to our timetable, but its own good time. In God's own good time, the coming kingdom is a promise. God provides a future beyond our knowledge and control. And not even the angels in heaven know the hour of its coming. What the author of Mark has heard 
in Jesus' story and has woven into the fabric of this gospel is that every moment of the passing day is already alive with the promise of God's future. As the church strains its sight towards the horizon, the coming kingdom, it also hears the tick talk of the clock on the wall and knows that each passing moment is filled with the potential for either faith or denial, decision or tragedy, hope or despair. Those who trust and hope in the promise of God's coming kingdom are also able to see advanced signs of its coming all around them. Those who believe that in God's good time, something is about to happen also know that even now something is happening. The passing moments of each day are like iron filings drawn, uh, iron filings drawn and aligned together in an unseen magnet, already shaped by God's future and filled with its force. I get the feeling here like nowhere else, mused the man, that something is about to happen. We sometimes lose sight of the fact that every moment of the church's life is formed by the exception or the expectation that something is about to happen. And this something has to do with God's coming power to the world. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Every time some congregation creates a clothing closet or a pantry for those in need, they do so not because they are so naive as to think that a few used garments or a shelf of soup and cereal are going to end human need. They do so because they live today in the light of God's tomorrow, when all will be clothed in garments of light and the banquet table of the kingdom will hold a feast. Come, Lord Jesus. Every time Christian people speak words of forgiveness in circumstances of bitterness, words of love in situations of hatred, they are speaking in the future present tense. That is, they are using in the present a language which the whole creation will learn to speak in God's tomorrow. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Every time worshipers struggle to their feet to sing, come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. They are praying for, expecting something to happen, someone to happen. Come, Lord Jesus, come.
God offers to us good news, and how do we respond? In the name of the Christ who was, who is, and who shall be, we gather all that we have and all that we are to become living signs of Emmanuel, God with us. In this place and in this world, today and all days, we offer what we can in the ways that we can in the name of the one we anticipate. Amen. Let us prepare ourselves for communion. Amen. If you are not prepared for communion, please put the recorded service on pause and prepare yourselves. It can be whatever you have on hand, coffee, tea, a muffin, toast. Remember that Jesus used bread and wine because that is what was available. I will be lifting bread and juice and I will invite you also to lift with me and we will all partake at the same time. Just a reminder that this is not the table of Gray Street United Church or St. Paul's United Church. This is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All who believe in him are welcome. Come for all things are now ready. All journeys begin with careful preparation. What to take, what to leave behind, thoughts of who we will meet along the way and what we will see. Our journey today to the manger begins with careful preparations made on our behalf. 
Bread and wine are made ready that we might have food that lasts as we venture out in faith once more, knowing we where we want to go, but not sure how we will get there. And so we come to this table, a place of welcome and hospitality for all. It is a table for those who are just beginning the journey, as well as for those well along its dusty pathway. It is for those who are clear about their direction, as well as for those who are putting one foot in front of the other, not sure where they are going. It is for those of great faith and those who struggle to have any at all. It is for each of us. And we are welcome here because we gather at Christ's invitation. So come to this table and set your sights on Bethlehem. God is with you. And also with you. Open your hearts. We open them to the sacred presence. Let us give thanks to God, our God. With joy, we give God thanks and praise. God most holy, we do give you thanks as we gather at Christ's table, as we remember your love, holy and whole, a love that has held us from the beginning and a love that will hold us as long as time exists. We need your wisdom, God. We need your guidance. We need your invitation, your calling, your whispers and your shouts through voices of prophets and priests, grandmothers and grandfathers, children and infants, all who listen and speak of your love. Because we didn't always listen, because we didn't, don't always listen, you gave us your Christ, alive in the world. Holy God and holy human, a tiny baby, a youth and adult, a teacher, a healer, a challenger, a savior. He laughed with those who laughed and cried with those who cried. But most of all, he loved us with a love that never, ever ends. A love that surpasses even death. A love that brings new life. Not only to us, but to all creation. Alleluia. Holy God, you are restorer, restorer of broken lives. You became one of us so we might see the dreams you have for us. On this day of communion, we think about and we pray for all of our friends in need. Let us pray silently. Knowing how our hearts and minds sometimes overflow with fear, with stress, with strain and pain, you have come with peace and with comfort. We pray all of these things to you, God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, because we know that you are like a mother who gives us life. So we eat, we drink, and we remember. Holy God, send your spirit upon us and upon these gifts that we share, that that they and we might truly be Christ's body and blood alive in the world. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. Amen. On the night before he was taken to, the, to his death on the cross, Jesus gathered with his disciples. No, he gathered with his friends. He shared with them a meal of remembrance and freedom. After an act of utmost humility and hospitality, washing their feet, he blessed the bread and broke it, saying, Take this and eat it. 
This is my body given for you. Each time you eat bread, remember me. The body of Christ for all creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. As the meal drew to a close, he blessed a cup of wine and passed it to them, saying, Take this and drink it. This is my promise, the promise in my life's blood, that all sins are forgiven. Each time you drink, remember me. The life's blood of Christ for all creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. With this taste of the bread of life, with this taste of the cup of love, send us into the world, God, so that we might whisper your coming, so that we might sing your advent, so that we might live your birth, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to be seated for the benediction. I invite you to close your eyes and take a moment to clear your mind. Clear your mind of everything and just bring your awareness to this present moment. Let us pray. 
Loving God, may this season of Advent be in our mind and in our thinking. I invite you with eyes still closed to take three deep and slow breaths. Be in our bodies and be in our breathing. I invite you with eyes still closed to put your hand upon your heart and to feel and to hear the heart beating. Be in our hearts and in our being. And now I invite you to smile. Spirit of love, may we move out into the world waiting, preparing, and serving to love and to be loved with our minds, with our bodies, with our hearts, and with our smiles. And now, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen.